I would like to say a special welcome to all those who are here who are part of Miss Amy May's family. We're so glad that you're here with us today. Uh, Miss Amy May, I'm guessing, is having a birthday today, a celebration over in the Fellowship Hall. And uh, we're so thankful for all of our visitors who are with us this morning uh, from anywhere uh, near and far. Bob was a man who, he came to the airport from being overseas and he bought this really expensive cheese while he was there. And U.S. Customs would not let him bring it into the United States. They said, sir, I'm sorry to tell you, you cannot bring that cheese into the U.S. He said, oh, yes, I will. I'm going to bring my cheese. He said, I paid a lot of money for this cheese. I'm going to bring it into the U.S. The officer said, sir, I'm sorry to tell you, you will not bring that cheese into the United States of America. He, Bob stomped his foot. He said, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to bring this cheese. He said, watch me. He grabbed his cheese. He stood over about three or four feet away. He opened that cheese, ate it just as fast as he could, and he came back over and he said, I told you I was going to bring it with me. You know, we live in a time where they say, you can't take Jesus in the world. You can't take God with you into school. But the truth is, we can do it. When he is part of our lives, he is within us. I want to share with you a lesson today that is based upon something that the Apostle Paul said. He said, be ye followers of me as I also am of Christ. He said, now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. I want to focus on this phrase today. Be ye followers of me as I also am of Christ. And I want us, if you can, if you have your Bibles, to open to Romans chapter 1. And what we're going to do is just stay right here in Romans chapter 1 and look at all the times when the Apostle Paul said, I am this or I am that. There's eight of them. In about nine verses, he says eight times, I am a servant. I am sincere. I am shameless and so on and so forth. So that's what we want to talk about. If he is the example, then we want to look to his example and see, all right, what are we going to do? How am I going to be like the Apostle Paul? So let's begin Romans chapter 1, and here, here is pretty much our lesson for today. Now, don't get nervous. We're not going to be here till midnight, all right? You say, man, there's eight points on the board. You ain't never done that before. <laughs> well, <laughs> just stay with me, all right? Let's look at number one. Let's begin in verse eight of Romans chapter one. Paul says, first of all, I am sentimental. He uses this word. I thank my God for you. That's pretty sweet words, isn't it? That's how he begins talking to his brethren. He said, I thank my God for you. He said, I'm a sentimental guy when it comes to my brethren. I'll give you some other verses. For instance, you look, he writes this way all the time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4, he said, I thank my God always on your behalf. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 4, he said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. I think about this one in 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. He said, we are bound always to give thanks to God for you, brethren. And then the last one, I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers. You know, I, I thought about this when I was studying, and I thought, you know what? When is the last time that I told my brothers and sisters that I was thankful for them? You've got to ask yourself this morning. When is the last time you went to a brother or sister in Christ and you said, I am so thankful for the work that you are doing for the Lord? Friend, I'll tell you, it means a lot. On occasions, I get cards in the mail from different people, and I'll tell you, sometimes it puts a tear in my eye. And they seem to come at just the right time, you know? You, you get down, and you're pretty low, and then all of a sudden, somebody will come along and pat you on the back. Paul said, let me tell you something. When it comes to my brothers and sisters, he said, I am sentimental. You know, I'm reminded of a guy, he complained, you know, he lived with nine people in the house, and uh, he went to a, his psychologist, and he just unloaded. He said, I am so sick and tired of living with nine people. Psychiatrist told him, he said, let me tell you something. I want you to bring a goat 
into your house for two weeks and you live with that goat and those nine people in your home for two weeks and you come back and see me in four. So we came back in four weeks and the psychiatrist asked him, he said, well, what did you find? He told the psychiatrist, he said, I'm so glad to be living with just nine people in my house. <laughs> you know, it's all in how you look at it. You know, we, I think, in my opinion, if we encouraged each other more and we told each other, you know what, I'm so thankful for what you're doing, I believe that people will be more encouraged to do it. Number two, not only did he say, I am sentimental, but he said, I'm a servant. Let's go on to the next verse, verse 9. He said, at first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Here's verse 9. For God is my witness whom I what? Who I serve with my spirit. I mean, if the apostle Paul is setting the example here and he is uh, sentimental and then he is a servant, I feel like that I should be the same way too, right? And I hope that you feel the same way. You look at Romans chapter 1, just go to the beginning of the book, and, and you'll notice how he began the book. He said, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. This is how he identified himself. You know, I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and you could just write this margin. I apologize, but every time I push the button, it jumps forward like three slides. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he identified himself once again as a servant. In fact, he said, though I be free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might gain the more. You read on down, he said, to the weak, I became as weak that I might gain the weak. To, to the Jew, I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jew. To them that are without law, I became as them without law that I might gain them that are without law. He concludes this section in verse 19. He said, I made all things to all men that by I might just save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be a partaker thereof with you. So, you know, he's a servant. He, he said, look, I'm going to be sentimental when it comes to my brethren. I'm going to serve my brethren when it comes to doing the work of the Lord. And certainly that is a good example for him to have. A man named John Galbraith wrote a book. And he told a story about a young lady that worked for him one time. She was his housekeeper. And the president of the United States, Lyndon B. Johnson, called John's house. And John told his housekeeper, he told her, he said, look, I don't want anybody to bother me for the next few hours. So if anybody calls, do not bother me. But the president, you know, Lyndon B. Johnson calls on the phone and she answers the phone and the president said, I need to speak to John and it's an emergency. She said, Mr. President, I'm sorry. You can't speak to John right now. He told me no one is to bother him for several hours. And Lyndon B. Johnson, he said, ma'am, I am the president of the United States. I need to speak to John right now. She said, to be honest, sir, I'm sorry and no disrespect, but it doesn't matter to me that you're the president. He told me nobody will bother him for the next few hours. <laughs> the president of the United States hired that woman to work in his office. <laughs> he took care of that I guess didn't he she was a faithful servant she did exactly what she was told to do it didn't matter who came in between you know I think of this passage when Jesus said well done thou good and what faithful servant thou hast been faithful over a few things I will make you ruler over many things enter into the joy of your Lord so we talk about being a servant. That's what the Apostle Paul said he was. And today I've got to ask myself, am I a servant of God? Are you today going to follow the example of the Apostle Paul and say, yes, I am a servant of God. Let's move on. He said, number three, I am sincere. Look at verse 11. I long to see you, to impart unto you a spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. I mean, he wanted to go and see his brethren. In fact, he told them a little bit earlier, he said, I've tried to come to you before, but, but something held me back. 
I wanted to come and see you. Look at all the times he refers to his brethren. Verse 8, he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ for you all. Verse 9 at the end, I make mention of you in my prayers. Verse 10 at the end, that I come to you. Verse 12, that I may be comforted together with you. Verse 13, look in the middle, I purpose to come unto you. And then lastly, in verse 15, he said, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Man, this guy, he has a love for his brethren. It's interesting to me that there were two commands that the Jews were given that were above all others. Do you remember what they were? Who can tell me? Brother Martindale, he's just waiting. He's like, love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's right. And the second one, love your neighbor as yourself. Man, that takes care of everything else. You know, God doesn't expect a man to be perfect, does he? Some of you today, if you're new to hearing the gospel or maybe new to being a Christian, you think, I just can't live the Christian life because I have to be perfect. God never wanted you to do that. You know what God wants from me? He wants my heart. It will show in my life when my heart is given to God. Everything else will fall into place. So the apostle Paul, he said, look, when it comes to my brethren, you better believe I'm sentimental. I'm a servant to my brethren. He said, I am sincere in my love for God and my love for my fellow man. That made him the real deal. I could have followed the apostle Paul around and I could have said, oh, there he made a mistake. He made a mistake. A few minutes later, I could have followed him around and said, oh, there's another one. That didn't make him fake. What would have made him fake is if he acted like he loved God when he really didn't inside of him. If he went to church and he sang, oh, how I love Jesus, and then he did whatever he wanted to during the week, and he didn't serve God or his fellow man throughout the entire week. Amen. Brethren, I hope today that I would never be that guy. I hope you would never be that person. What makes us real, brethren? It makes us real when we say, I love God with everything I have, and I'm going to be a servant to God for the rest of my life. Friend, I hope that identifies both of us here this morning. I think of this passage in Romans chapter 9 and verse 1 when he said, I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He was willing to sacrifice himself so that someone else would go to heaven. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm going to try my hardest to do that. <laughs> that is tough. I think about Billy, little boy, who was a very sincere young man. He was about eight years old, and his mama woke up one morning, and she noticed that her flowers were missing that she had just picked the day before. Well, Billy rode the bus to school, so she thought, you know what, I'm going to surprise him, and I'm going to pick him up today, and I'm going to tell him what I think about what he did with my flowers. She was real picky about stuff like that. She was very annoyed by it. So she showed up at the school building and she walked into Billy's classroom and the teacher stopped her and she said, let me tell you something. You have a very special boy, that Billy. There's a little girl in our classroom who said that her parents were getting a divorce and that nobody loved her. And Billy brought her some flowers this morning and said, I will always love you. That changed her mind. She said, you know what? I'm so proud of you, Billy. I'm so proud of what you did. It's interesting to me that in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 1, he said, except you be converted and become as what? As little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. You want to know what's so special about those little ones? They are sincere people. Do they make a lot of mistakes? You better believe it. But they're the real deal. Let's move on. 
Paul said, let me, let me tell you another thing about myself. He said, I'm not boasting, but I want to tell you that I'm saved. Look at verse 12. He said in verse 11 that I'll impart to you a spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. Verse 12, that is, I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith. He's talking to saved people. And he's talking about being saved. So that's one more thing that Paul sets the example for us today. He said, look, I just want to let you know today that I'm a saved person. There was a marshal in the army of Napoleon and he was wounded and he was laying on his deathbed dying and Napoleon came in to visit his friend. You know, people thought of Napoleon as a god. You know what that marshal in his army said to Napoleon? Napoleon, I'm dying. Save me. Save me, Napoleon. Napoleon said, I I can't save you. The man pulled Napoleon close to him and he said, save me. I know you can save me. Napoleon left the room and the man was still yelling, save me. He couldn't do it. He died. But it's interesting in Matthew chapter 14, you remember when there was a storm on the water and Peter was in the boat and he saw Jesus walking on the water and he said, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come to you on the water. And he got out of the boat. But when he saw the wind was boisterous and afraid, he began to sink and he cried out and he said the same thing that Marshall said. He said, Lord, save me. You know what Jesus did? Immediately, he says, immediately he stretched forth his hand and caught him. Friend, I want to tell you today that Jesus is waiting for you. And if you're ready to cry out for the Lord to save your soul today, he'll save you too. You've got to do it on his terms. You've got to do it in his way. But I'm going to tell you something. You've got to be willing to step out of the boat. So if you're here today, I've got to ask you, are you sentimental towards your brethren? Are you a servant to your brethren? Are you sincere in your love for God and for other people? And I want to ask you, friend, are you saved? Have you stepped out of the boat? Number five, I like this one. The apostle Paul said there, I am a spokesman. Look here in verse 13. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you. He said, I tried to come to you before preach the gospel but something happened he said I was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you even as among other Gentiles the fruit that he's talking about having among them is preaching the gospel to them seeing people obey it and them going to teach others the gospel produces fruit friend here's where it gets difficult once you are saved Just like the Apostle Paul, there is a responsibility to produce fruit. It's kind of like what Jesus said when he told uh, Andrew and Simon Peter, he said, follow me and I will make you what? Fishers of men. You know what that tells me? That if I'm not a fisher of men, I'm also not what? I'm not a follower of Christ. Jesus' number one goal is mentioned in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 when he said, I am come to seek and to save that which was lost. And friend, I hope today that above anything else I could say about myself, not not only am I all these things, but most importantly, I want to be a spokesman for God. I know what you're thinking. You say, well, preacher, look, I can't do that. (laughs) I'm sorry. I'm not comfortable with people. Friend, I'm not comfortable either. You think about the things that I have to stand and mention in this pulpit that make me uncomfortable. 95% of the time, I'm uncomfortable. It's not easy, brethren. God is not going to allow us to get to the judgment day and say, I didn't do it just because it wasn't easy. John Wesley was a scholar of his day. I don't agree with everything that he believed and taught, but he was a scholar, and he his students two questions when they came back from converting people he asked them two questions he said number one was anybody converted 
Number two, did anybody get mad? Because it's usually going to be one of the two, right? Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, they were pricked in their heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what shall we do? But then you come to Acts chapter 7 and verse 54, they were also pricked in their heart and you know what they did? They murdered the preacher. They took Stephen outside the gates of the city and they stoned him to death. Both times they were pricked in their hearts with two different reactions. Friend, no matter what, we've got to be spokesmen for God. In 1981, there was a man who stole a car. The problem was the police were looking for him for multiple charges, but the man from whom he stole the car, he left rat poison with food in the front seat. So if that man who stole the car were to eat any of that food, guess what would happen to him? He would die. So the police are trying to find the thief not only to bring him to justice, but to save his life. Friend, I want to tell you today, the longer that we remain on the run from God, the harder it will be to turn around. But God is looking for us not only to bring us to justice, but most importantly to save us from the damage that we are causing in our lives. Apostle Paul said, that's my message. I'm going to tell people that. I'll give you a verse and I'll speed this up. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16, he said, though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Notice, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And I'll tell you today, woe is unto me also, and woe is unto you if we do not preach the gospel. Paul said, I'm going to set the example. I'm all these things. I'm also a spokesman for God, but let me continue. He said, I'm also a living sacrifice for God. Let's move on down to verse 14. He said three words, I am debtor. When I looked at this word, I have a note here. Uh, when I looked this up, and it literally means to be a delinquent that owed. A delinquent that owed something. You know what the Apostle Paul is saying here? I'm a debtor to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the white. He said, I owe it to you. You are created in the image of God, and I owe it to you to preach the gospel to you, and I also owe it to God to be a living sacrifice for him. Jesus said it this way. When you have done all that which is your duty to do, you are still unprofitable servants. What did Jesus mean by that? Is he trying to put us down and say, we're, we're not ever worth anything no matter how hard we work? No. What he is saying is, that's your job. <laughs> You know, my kids get an allowance weekly for doing special things, but I'm not going to give them allowance for doing their job, right? You know, there are special things that they do to make money, but there are certain things that they do just because they live in the house. That's what Jesus is saying. I owe it to God to be all these things that the Apostle Paul is talking about here. Let's move on. Let's talk about being steadfast. You move on down there and look in verse 15. He said, so as much as in me is, notice, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. There were 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence. I want to tell you about some of these men. Five of them were captured and tortured. Twelve of them had their homes burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary War. Two of them had sons that were captured. Nine of these men died in war. Friend, I would say that's probably more than half. The Declaration of Independence is something that they were willing to give their lives for. And we are enjoying the benefits of it today. I'm so thankful for those steadfast people were our forefathers perfect? No, they had a lot of flaws. But I'll tell you this, they were willing to die to make this country free, and that's exactly what they gave us. They were steadfast. The Apostle Paul said this. 
In Acts chapter 21 and verse 13, they told the apostle Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, you will be killed. You know what his response was? You think I don't know that? (laughs) That's what I read when I read this chapter. He said, know that. And he said, let me tell you this, you don't need to be weeping and breaking my heart because I'm ready not to be bound only but to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So don't stand, don't sit here and give me a pity party is what he's saying. I know that it's gonna hurt you if I go there and die, but look, we need to be strong right now. He said, I'm steadfast even to the point of death. Last and finally. He said, I'm shameless. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek, Romans chapter one and verse 16. That is the key to the entire book. You know what this book is about? It's about the difference between the old law, the Jewish law, and the New Testament of Jesus Christ. The difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he said, let me tell you something about the gospel of Christ. It is the best thing that has ever happened to this world. And he said, I am not ashamed of it at all. But he begins to tell his story. He begins to tell how insignificant the old law was in his life. It could not save him. That's why he was converted to Christianity. Friend, I hope today that you are shameless when it comes to the gospel. There was a preacher of old time named T.B. Larimore. He said, I'm afraid to be ashamed and I'm ashamed to be afraid. He was ready to preach, friend. I'll conclude with this. Paul is writing once again and he said, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness, he said, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Friend, are you sentimental? God, are you sincere in your love for God, your fellow man? Are you saved today? Are you a spokesman for him? Have you made yourself a living sacrifice? Are you steadfast and are you shameless? When I think about these things, friend, it really, really makes me think. As we close today, I want to give you some practical applications very quickly. Something I notice about the Apostle Paul, he did not sit in a pew. When I read all these things about what he is doing, he was not a man who just came to church. How can I say that I'm a faithful Christian and not be these things? I'll tell you, man, it hits me in the chest. Number two, Paul was a man who was deeply concerned about the well-being and salvation of other people. How could I call myself a faithful Christian and not be concerned about my brethren in Christ? Number three, He would rather serve than be served. How could I call myself a faithful Christian and not be involved in the work of Christ? Number four and finally, he was willing to teach someone else. How could I say I'm a follower of Christ but not be a fisher of men? Friend, I hope you receive it today. I hope this message is riveted upon your life and heart and mind. And I hope that I will study this and grow and be the best person that God wants me to be. And I hope that you will too. If you're not saved today, I want to encourage you to think about it. Have you obeyed the gospel by believing that Jesus is the Christ? I mean, do you really believe or do you just say you believe? If you really believe, you'll be motivated to repent of a past lifestyle that is away from God and say, no, I'm gonna turn to serve God now. The Bible calls that repentance. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish, Luke 13, three. And based upon that change that I've made in my mind, I will say it with my mouth. And Jesus said, whosoever therefore will confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father who's in heaven. God knows if you say it, 
you will do it. The Bible says that I must be baptized into Christ. In fact, you cannot get around it. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3, 21, very clearly, baptism doth also now save us. It's there, friend. It doesn't matter what the guy on television says. It doesn't matter what the preacher down the road has told you. The Bible says baptism doth also now save us. When they said, what do we need to do in Acts 2.38, he told them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. It's there, friend. We just want to accept it the way God has written it. And finally, Jesus said, be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Have you become unfaithful today? I hope that you'll come, that you'll obey the gospel if you've never done it, even now, as we stand, as we sing.